From the beginning of Montana's distinctive yet troubled history, the Treasure State was dominated, both economically and politically, by powerful outside interests who shipped in capital and bought control of the state. Historians tell us that as the Anaconda Company and its friends ran Montana, economic and political power flowed out into the hands of distant capitalists and corporations. Policy was determined in far off New York City and control of the press was rigid. Anaconda's corporate dominance in Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. For its first 75 years, Montana was a one company state. But then big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Between 1965 and 1980, Montanans ripped off their copper collar, transforming Montana from a corporate colony into a free modern state. The people finally control their own destiny. The pitched battle between the people and the established power structure was not easily won, but fired in a crucible of change. A new Montana was born. Join Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time as they shine a light on this remarkable era. Welcome to In the Crucible of Change. This series about Montana history from the period of 1965 to 1980 is about the progressive change made in Montana when we escaped from the copper collar that had dominated Montana for the first 75 years of its statehood. Uh, this, is, uh, this program today, we have some extraordinarily qualified and unique individuals who are going to provide some interesting perspective about those first 75 years, uh, both the period in which we were economically, socially, and politically dominated by the Anaconda Company and its allies, and the eventual seeds of change that started happening in the 1950s and leading into the 1960s that kind of set the stage for the change to a people-oriented state that took place during the essentially second progressive era of Montana politics and history in the 1965 to 1980 period. We're joined by two special professors of Montana history. Uh, uh, Harry Fritz uh, is the, uh, was a UM professor of history for 40 years uh, before he retired, chairman of the history department there for 14 years. Uh, he took over Montana history uh, at the University of Montana when uh, preeminent Montana historian Ross Toole died. And uh, Harry, uh, got his BA from Dartmouth and his uh, master's from the UM, his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, uh, in addition to uh, teaching Montana history for so many years, Harry helped make some Montana history. Harry was a member of the Montana legislature, the House for two sessions, and the Senate for two sessions, serving in 1985 and 87 sessions in the House and the 1991 to 93 sessions in the Senate. Uh, in addition, uh, Bob Swartout, uh, Carroll College Professor Emeritus, and by the way, I must say, Harry has been designated a Professor Emeritus at UM as well. Uh, Bob Swartout is a Carroll College University, uh, a Carroll College Professor Emeritus who uh, focused uh, su uh, substantially on Montana history and other things. Uh, Bob uh, got his uh, BA and his MA from Portland State University and then his PhD from Washington State University. Uh, Bob was a professor of history for 36 years at Carroll College, including 24 years as chairman of the department. And he spent two decades being an advisor to the Montana, the magazine of Western history, which is produced out of the Montana Historical Society. In addition, these two gentlemen are partners in a way because they are uh, co, they, they produce two anthologies as co-authors and co-editors of two anthologies on Montana history, one called Montana Heritage and one called Montana Legacy. Both excellent books to uh, get, get a handle on Montana history. So. We're pleased to have you here because you can lend a sense of perspective to the change that needed to happen for Montana to become uh, a different kind of state than it was for its first 75 years. Let's start with the, uh, uh, the real seeds of Montana's uh, uh, copper collar, which probably came with the formation of the Montana Constitution back in 1889, first 1884 and 1880. Why don't you start us with that a little bit, Bob, and give you your reflections on that constitution and how it 
was designed, as so many elements are, to protect the interests of those that had economic and political power at the time. Okay, well, I'd begin by saying that mining was tremendously critical to the evolution of Montana mm -hmm. as a territory and then a state. It becomes a territory in 1864. That wouldn't have happened had it not been for the gold mining frontier that explodes across Montana in the early 1860s. Uh, over the next decade or so, as, as gold mining begins to falter a bit, silver mining becomes a big business in Montana by the 1870s. Uh, and in the 1880s, copper comes on the scene. So again, you can't understand the history of Montana without appreciating the importance of mining in Montana's history. Uh, by the 1880s, the railroads had arrived in Montana. Uh, the first transcontinental railroad to, build, to be built entirely across Montana uh, was the Northern Pacific. Once the railroads are in place, they bring, begin to bring uh, new folks into Montana, uh, begin to make uh, industrial mining, underground mining possible in Montana. So in the 1880s, the population begins to grow. Uh, there's a chance that Montana would have enough people to qualify for statehood. Uh, so there's an early effort to do that. They actually write up a constitution that might serve as a state constitution in 1884. Um, all the forces aren't quite in place to bring about statehood, so it's postponed for roughly a half decade. Finally, in 1889, this log jam is broken. Several new states are brought into the Union in 1889. So Montana is part of that. They kind of trot out that 1884 constitution they had originally written. Uh, adjust it a little bit, uh, and then present it so that Montana can gain statehood status. Uh, and given the economic, and by the way, I will mention to our to our uh, viewers that these are always conversations that we engage in, and so uh, feel free to you jump in on anything I might be asking or talking about, and I'll be doing the same thing. Uh, essentially, because of the preeminence and the economic importance of mining to Montana, clearly when the document was written, it uh, took care of mining because the, the forces that were, were there, I think the president of both constitutional conventions was uh, W.A. Clark, one of the Copper Kings, wasn't it? Uh, that's correct, yes. And, uh, but, but they did reflect the economic and social needs of the mining and other vested interests at that time, but that's kind of understandable. It's where it went right. from there was maybe the issue. So the two, the two groups that were most crucial in writing the document were uh, ranching forces in Montana mm -hmm. and mining forces. And they saw eye to eye on a lot of issues. Uh, so they cooperate in producing that document. And again, it then becomes the, the constitution under which the state operates uh, from 1889 until 1972, when Montana's second constitution is voted on and ratified. Harry? And, and I think those economic interests that you say the, 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 the agricultural interests, predominantly stock growers and that type, and the, and the condo company and the mining interests, kind of stayed in coalescence until all the way through the 75 years, I believe, didn't they? I think so, and that's a process that we're going to begin to trace uh, today. Uh, I hold the decade of the 1880s to be the single most important decade in the entire history of Montana. Uh, right behind it is the decade that we'll be investigating from 65 to 75 or 80 or so. It's in the uh, 1880s where the mining industry, especially the copper industry, uh, came to uh, fruition. It's the decade of the hard winter and the beginning of the modern cattle industry in Montana. The logging industry boomed and of course the decade culminated in statehood. Montana became the 41st state in the nation in uh, 1889. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, once we became a state, in the, in the 1890s, there was a lot of formative activity going on inside the government and the kind of the tune. Well, tone I, think, of uh, I think the main thrust of Montana history in these early years is economic, and yeah. it centers around the mining, the logging, the agricultural sectors of the economy. The Constitution, of course, is a political uh, document. It's a very conservative document politically. It, uh, it circumscribes legislative action. It, it creates a plural executive. There's no strong executive in early Montana history. And it does, as Bob mentioned, uh, give the economic uh, aspects of the territory, mining and, uh, and ranching especially, uh, 
uh, preferred status. You know, we talk in later uh, programs a bit about the strengthening of the executive branch that occurred during the uh, period of the crucible of change and the strengthening of the legislature. Uh, but clearly the early document had a weak executive, a weak executive branch because it was so diffused yes. and not a powerful governor and then a fairly weak legislative branch too because it was not empowered to uh, staff wise and those kind of things didn't happen. So uh, did that, was that something with which the powers that be, if you will, were, had some comfort level, would you guess? I think so. Uh, certainly when the legislature meets only for 60 days every two years. Calendar days. Too. When most uh, yeah. Montanans wish it met for two <laughs> days every 60 years. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, it's a conservative document, the Constitution of 1889, like similar uh, mm -hmm. constitutions. Uh, and uh, it was out of date almost before the ink was dry. Mm -hmm. uh, the first governor of Montana to call for a new constitution, a new constitutional convention, was Governor Joe Dixon in the early 19, 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's the movement for constitutional reform, which we'll be tracing again in part today. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, after the Constitution's in place and the government comes in place, the, uh, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, dramatic uh, uh, incidents that started to really establish the economic and, I mean, the powerful dominance of the uh, Anaconda Company uh, or its predecessor was uh, what happened in 1903. Uh, can you tell a little bit about that? Because that's such a dramatic episode. I mean, it's... Sure. Well, I think Harry makes an important point that when he says that the Constitution was almost out of date from the time that it was written, it was a 19th century document. We need to think of it in those terms. Mm -hmm. In the, in, until the very late 19th century, America was a primarily agrarian country, an agrarian society. Uh, during the last third of the 19th century, America embraces the Industrial Revolution, but the laws were slow to adjust to that. So again, I think it's helpful to think of that original Constitution not only as a conservative document, but in some respects as an agrarian document, not a document that was attuned to the industrial changes that were taking place in American society. Lawmakers couldn't imagine the kind of power that, that these new uh, uh, industrial companies would be able to exercise. But Montanans began to get uh, a strong glimpse of that early on. Uh, the Anaconda Company begins to arise in the 1880s. Uh, in 1899, uh, something known as Amalgamated, a company known as Amalgamated, uh, with its roots in New York, uh, it That's takes... That's where Marcus Daly, just prior to his death, sold all of his interests to this right. New York group. And, well, and it wasn't a hostile takeover. No, it was a no. friendly takeover. It included people like uh, William Rockefeller, Henry Rogers. Uh, but these were people who wanted to establish a kind of monopoly control over the copper industry, not just within the U.S., but around the world. And this Anaconda Copper Mining Company was one of the chief targets. Uh, they create a holding company called Amalgamated. And it begins to buy up different copper companies uh, throughout the United States and other places. Uh, they take control of the Anaconda Company in 1889. Uh, 1899. And, and, excuse me, 1899. Yeah. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, showdown begins to develop among the copper kings. And by the early 20th century, one of the other copper, in, in, 19, in 1900, Marcus Daly passes away. Right. William Clark, of course, is still very much alive. Uh, but there's a young fellow by the name of Fritz uh, F. Augustus Heinze, often known as Fritz Heinze, who decides that he wants to challenge uh, the power of Amalgamated and the power of Anaconda. And he has friends uh, in the courts uh, in Butte. Uh, one of those is a judge by the name of William Clancy. Uh, he would often attempt to tie up uh, properties uh, that were claimed by Amalgamated, often using something called the Apex Law. A lot of Montanans I are familiar with that. I think we discussed that Apex Law, that if, you're, if the, if the uh, vein broke the surface, you could follow it anywhere it went and take That's everything. Right. And Heinze was essentially 
according to the amalgamated, stealing a bunch of its underground copper. That's a harsh word. You know, it's a harsh yeah. word, Evan. But yeah. but he had a nose for copper. Yeah. We like to say it. At the very least, he would often then uh, tie up their properties in in court cases, and he would often get a friendly hearing in these Butte courts. So amalgamated became so frustrated that they wanted a change of venue law. Uh, they wanted to be able to take these cases someplace other than Ju Judge Clancy's court. How could they get that? They decided they wanted a special bill passed by the Montana State Legislature. In October of 1903, they closed down all their operations in Montana. All the mines, all the smelters, overnight 15,000 workers are thrown out of work. And if you think of the ripple effect, what about the other members of those families what about the clerks working in stores where, where the miners would buy their goods? Uh, it ripples through the entire state economy. They closed down all their operations in the state, October 1903, and then say to the governor of Montana, Governor Joseph Toole, we want you to convene a special session of the state legislature where the legislature can take up this one bill. Uh, they called it... Uh, a fair trials bill, right, Harry? Change your menu bill, fair mm -hmm. trials. Uh, and what does Governor Toole do to this kind of blackmail? Well, he held out for as long as he could, <laughs> which is about two or three weeks. Yeah. And then uh, when you have 15,000 workers uh, out of work at the beginning of winter, uh, you basically have to kowtow to the company's uh, will. Uh, Essentially a capitulation, and, and but it, it was a good example. Well, he's of, not only getting pressure from the company, yeah. but he's now getting pressure. He's getting letters, telegrams from, from these workers and their families thrown out of work. They're saying to him, this bill may not be fair, but we need our jobs back. You know, the, I don't know if it's anecdotal or whether it's actually the, uh, been established by the facts, but uh, there are certain things that, that, that there was uh, bribery alleged Obviously, the, the, that uh, Clark, we discuss this in other programs, uh, Clark's bribery was a personal level bribery about him wanting to be a U.S. Senator. And so he bribed a couple succession sessions of the legislature to try to become Senator. One of, uh, eventually he became, got there after his fifth try, but uh, uh, for a fairly nondescript ter single term. But Heinze supposedly felt like I don't need to bribe 150 or 100 legislators. I just need to have friends, as you would say, uh, in the two judges in Butte. And all the cases arose in Butte, and, uh, and supposedly there was uh, some money behind all that. Uh, but that being said, the amalgamated wanted to fix it and asked the governor to fix it. And very, you understand this, particularly as being, you had to go out and rustle for votes to run in the legislature. When you're electorate, it isn't just that the Anaconda or the amalgamated shut down, but those impacted workers were voters. I'm a governor. I say, well, okay, so mm -hmm. guess what? We, we, we pass a change of venue law, which probably was in one shape or another probably well, a good policy. I've always argued that the single most important event in the entire history of Montana is the coming of the railroads in the 1880s because mm -hmm. it jump-started the economy in all of right. its aspects. But right behind that, if not uh, a close uh, equal, uh, is the consolidation, uh, centralization of the mining industry in mm -hmm. Butte, which we call the War of the Copper Kings mm -hmm. or, or the Wars of the Copper Kings, of which this 1903 shutdown, this corporate shakedown of Montana, is a central and pivotal uh, event. Uh, but what I think needs to be uh, understood about this, and historians have not liked this at all, mm -hmm. corporate uh, control of Montana, is that the, it was absolutely necessary to continue mining uh, copper mm -hmm. uh, in Butte, in Montana, on an economic uh, basis. Because the apex law, the fractured veins, uh, meant that all of these claims were tied up in courts. Fritz Heinze uh, had a firm with a hundred lawyers in it, a hundred mm -hmm. lawyers to stymie his competition by taking them to court with his favorable uh, judges. So until most of the copper mining in Butte uh, was under a single corporate control, it couldn't continue very long. So the policy that this uh, incident 
uh, that came out of this incident. That policy was probably well-founded, but the politics of it were revealing of this consolidation of political power, not just economic power. The politics of it reverberated for the rest of the 20th century, yeah. right up uh, right. So that period. So there we go. And uh, one to wrap up that story then, the, the law is written up, it's passed very quickly by the legislature, so it becomes part of the state law. Uh, uh, the legislature then uh, goes about its business. The, the session ends. Heinze then says, all right, well, I give it my best shot. Uh, over 1905-1906, he then sells out his properties to Amalgamated at a handsome profit. Uh, in return, he agrees to halt the 100 lawsuits that his <laughs> lawyers had pending against other Amalgamated properties. So, so he makes his pile of money out of this. He then goes off to Wall Street where he takes on other mm -hmm. challenges, and this time he bites off more than he can chew, and, and he, he doesn't win in those fights. Uh, but Amalgamated is able to consolidate all of those properties. And then finally in 1915, Amalgamated disappears as a holding company. All of its properties are, are blended together into a single entity that is renamed ACM, the Anaconda Copper Mining Anaconda Company. Copper Mining and, at, company. and at the time that this happened, it was the largest copper company, not just in Montana, not just in the U.S., it's the largest copper company in the world with assets of more than $100 million. Yeah. And it would soon be the fourth largest corporation anywhere in the world, corporation of any kind mm -hmm. in the world by the 1920s, when it acquired the, uh, the means of processing and selling mm -hmm. uh, goods made from copper. And uh, it's worth noting that in this period we're talking about, in 1912, uh, you know, they always found a way, to get, for example, to get the lumber. They got Plum Creek or their Anaconda uh, Lumber Company, so they had lumber for the railroad ties to deliver stuff, but also lumber for timbering the mines. They needed, with the smelting processes, uh, they needed electricity. and. Out of that, in 1912 came the Montana Power Company. It was really an offspring of the Anaconda Company and became almost a, a partner of them politically forever until the demise of the Anaconda yeah. Company. Yeah, they, those two companies, the Montana Twins, had an interlocking board of directors and a sa the same president, mm -hmm. president of both uh, Anaconda and Montana Power. These no, were the Montana Twins. It's fair to say that uh, that the amalgamated, first even before amalgamated, and then amalgamated, then ACM, had a strong impact on electing, electing people in Montana. And most of the uh, people elected to be governor of Montana uh, were uh, approved by, the strong, say, the mining interests. Very seldom did the mining interests not elect who they wanted to as governor. But in 1920, they were facing a dilemma. Uh, because Burton K. Wheeler, who was a progressive that they didn't particularly care for because of some of his activities in Butte, was running as the Democrat, and they usually supported Democrats who were mostly governors at the, that time. And then Joe Dixon, a prog very progressive Republican, was running, and the Anaconda Company was facing, amalgamated, uh, Anaconda ACM at that, it was facing a dilemma. What emerged out of that, Harry? Uh, well, they chose the uh, lesser of two evils from their point of view. I think uh, we need to remember that in the early 20th century, for the most part, the Republican Party was the progressive party in the American party system. Mm -hmm. The Democratic Party nationally, with its base in the uh, solid uh, uh, post-Civil War South, was the conservative uh, party. Now, each party had its, uh, the Republican Party had a conservative wing, which would ultimately take over in the 1930s, the Democratic Party. Uh, had a liberal wing which got Woodrow Wilson elected in, 19, in 1912. Mm -hmm. uh, but in 1920, uh, there were two progressives running for the uh, office of governor. Uh, uh, Burton K. Wheeler, the Democrat, and Joseph Dixon, the uh, Republican. And Burton K. Wheeler had a little more of a radical uh, reputation. He'd supported the Nonpartisan League in North Dakota, which was a socialist uh, organization, government ownership of grain elevators and railroads and so forth. Uh, and uh, Joseph Dixon seemed to be the, the more logical choice. So they, they supported the Republican, uh, Joseph Dixon, who turned around and taxed them. Lo and behold, uh, uh, he did win. He did and win. He became governor, but once he became governor, uh, 
that lesser of two evils decided that taxing more for the mining companies a little bit more, or maybe even a lot more, was something that we ought to do. Well, and as Harry said, uh, both Dixon and Wheeler were hardcore progressives, and the progressive movement uh, that came about in the first two decades of the 20th century arose in part because of the Industrial Revolution that had taken place in the late 19th century. Uh, they feared that the tremendous economic power that these corporations were gaining could be a threat to America's democratic institutions. Now, the, uh, the great majority of progressives were not socialists, were not leftists. Uh, they saw themselves as traditional Americans in many ways, but again, they feared that these massive amounts of money that the Industrial Revolution was producing uh, could be a threat to America's traditional democratic order. And so they wanted to rein in the power of these corporations. Uh, and Wheeler felt that way, Dixon felt that way. Uh, the company was more familiar with, with Wheeler in a sense because he had been a federal attorney in Butte during the First World War and had fought for workers' rights during that time. And of course, workers in Butte meant, meant workers in the mines in Butte during that time period. Um, so the company, the Anaconda Company, was concerned about Wheeler and the position that he was taking on many of these issues. In fact, uh, another development was taking place, and that had to do with newspapers in Montana. Mm -hmm. uh, the Anaconda Company was beginning to take control of most of the major dailies in the state. Uh, so that the company voice could be, be put forward. In the 1920 election, as I recall, that was about the first time these papers began to refer to Burton K. Wheeler as Bolshevik Burt. Mm -hmm. uh, now, he was, no, Burt. he was no Bolshevik. <laughs> he he, he too, wasn't yeah, a communist, yeah. but again, he was too anti-corporation for the company's concerns. And this was a way of discrediting him. I, again, it wasn't so much that they were for Dixon, is that they were against Burton K. Wheeler. And Burton K. Wheeler's political career was by no means over. No. Because two years later, in 1922, he was elected to the first of four consecutive terms as a United States Senator from uh, Montana. It's, I think it's interesting that, that having, uh, clearly the Anaconda Company had enough political uh, strength and Im influence to help Joe Dixon get elected, even though he was just the lesser of two evils. But once he taxed him, what happened in 1924 to Joe Dixon? Well, he put he put the the, the gross uh, profits metal mines tax on, the, on ballot, the ballot, a good progressive tactic. Right. And the company turned its attention to him, the candidate, and not to the issue. And the tax so he passed. lost, and the tax won. They killed him, but they got the tax. And again, one reason the tax that tax was on the ballot was because back in the 1889 state constitution. Uh, the mining companies essentially got a free ride. They would not be taxed according to uh, the language in the 1889 state constitution. And in, 19, in 1917, uh, Evan, a, uh, an economist from the University of Montana published a book uh, called The Taxation of Mines in Montana, a very sexy title. Uh, and the company called attention to that book by trying to suppress it and by trying to get the author fired from his job at the, at the University of Montana. But that book revealed that as an industry, uh, the mines paid nowhere near their fair share when you compared them to the railroads, to the agricultural industry, to the timber industry. Their taxation was minimal. So it was a question of fairness by 1924. It, in the it seems to me that, that with the demise of Dixon, even though there was the passage of the tax, that 24 may have represented the end of the first progressive era of Montana politics. That's what the, that's what we usually and argue. It ended it ended on the national level yeah. with the failure of the to ratify the Versailles Treaty in 1919. Yeah. But it lasted another term, the first Dixon administration in in Montana. And then, uh, essentially, I like to think that if the copper collar was kind of tightened about that point and stayed firmly around the state until we started reaching into this second progressive period. But there are some, now this press thing is a very interesting thing. I, most people don't remember that, that control of the press that occurred back then. Uh, I mean, it, they owned virtually all the day, all but one major daily as well, I Well, to tick off some of those papers, I mean, you've got uh, the Anaconda Standard, 
the Montana Standard, the Missoulian, your paper. Joseph Dixon. The Helena um, Independent Record. Billings the, Gazette. The Billings Gazette. All are owned at this point by the Anaconda all Company. All except the Great Falls Tribune, which ironically was more conservative than all the yeah, company papers. Yeah. But, but they ended up uh, uh, not necessarily putting out erroneous news, but essentially controlling the news by suppression, if you will, is that to make sure that things counter right. to their interests did not appear in the news? Did well, that well, one way of approaching it is to say that, say in the first decade or so of the company's control of these newspapers, uh, the newspapers would run stories attacking the enemies of the company. Right. But voters picked up on that, said, well, gee, if, if, if the newspaper is attacking so-and-so, maybe he's somebody I should vote for. Maybe this means mm -hmm. that he's not such a bad guy after all. And so, uh, certainly by the early 1930s, the company had begun to shift its policy, and instead of attacking its foes, it simply top, stopped reporting news about them. Their names disappeared uh, from the papers altogether. Harry, there was a term it's that called, was used for this. The right? journalists call it Afghanistanism. <laughs> the readers in Montana, newspaper readers in Montana, learned all there was to know about what was going on in Afghanistan, but nothing about what was going on in Helen. <laughs> in fact, there was a poll taken by uh, professional journalists looking at all 48 states. This was before Hawaii and Alaska had been added to the Union. Uh, this was in the early 50s, as I recall. A poll was taken of the 48 states to see how well they covered local news, state news. And out of the 48, Montana ranked 47th in its coverage. Well, uh, <laughs> Montana was always seen as one of the two corporate-dominated states in the, in the union of 48 states at the time. The mm -hmm. other was Delaware, Delaware with yeah. the DuPont uh, Company Corporation. And the other was Montana under Anaconda, yeah. under the thumb of Anaconda. And you know, dominating Delaware, which is that big, is a lot different than dominating you know, 144,000 square miles of Montana. Yeah, uh, Delaware is about as big as Beaverhead yeah, County. Yeah, so. but, I, but I think Anaconda was able to do that in part because it also had important allies. And we made reference to this a little bit earlier. But in terms of their political goals, those often aligned with with the Montana Stock Growers Association, with the various railroads that were active in Montana in the first half yeah. of the 20th century. So they had, they had allies or colleagues, if you will, who could help to push that agenda. Now, the I'm going to continue on that thought, but let me finish one other thing and, and mention that. That control of the press, the Anaconda Company, controlled that press until they sold it out in 1959, all the way almost to 1960. And right about it, that certainly was an element of opening for change happening when they got rid of that. But there was a, 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 a population thing built into uh, and change that uh, took place later. We had a shift of population, if you will, uh, that started occurring because we were a rural state and our constitution was rural, as you said. But eventually, that started to change as well, and, and that was, uh, and that led to the, the the reapportionment, and that shift of population started to change things, uh, uh, and that started changing the elements of control in Montana. Uh, why don't you well, jump in? Right. On that? Well, the greatest single boom in Montana's population growth occurred during the first 20 years of the 20th century, during that progressive era, from roughly 1900 to 1920 we have in Montana what's known as the homestead era. And literally tens of thousands of people poured into Montana uh, to settle on homesteads across the state. Uh, uh, it, it dramatically increases the population of the state. It leads to what we sometimes call county splitting. Uh, Montana went yeah. from having a dozen or so counties all the way up to uh, the current number of 56. Uh, most of the county, county splitting took place in eastern Montana. Mm -hmm. So again, the rural population grew dramatically uh, during the first 20 years of the 20th century. And so did the female population. And in fact, when, when, when women's suffrage is then passed in Montana during the Progressive Era, it passes in part because it's strongly supported by these homestead communities. Mon about 1915 was the first year where there was sex equity in Montana, roughly equal number of males and females. And, and it's, it's those homestead females that passed, uh, uh, or, or, well, or convinced their husbands and their, their mothers. Their spouses. <laughs> they were, uh, the, 40, the, uh, the females 
uh, past prohibition. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> yeah. A, <laughs> yeah. And 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 the but the women's suffrage. It's interesting to note it had to be passed by male voters that had to be influenced. It by, was close, but and it was like forty six percent or forty eight percent voted against it, but it still did pass, and that was part of that progressive era. But we started to see a change in both the demographics of Montana, the population of Montana over time, uh, and that reflected itself in reapportionment. I think. Uh, uh, taking right. hold and making a governmental difference then. Well then, starting in about 1919, from 1919 to the early 20s, uh, Montana goes through uh, terrible drought conditions, especially in eastern Montana. Uh, and agriculture is devastated. Two, th two things are happening. This terrible drought hits Montana, and then with the end of the First World War, agricultural prices suddenly plummet as, as mm -hmm. European soldiers can return home and start growing their own grains and whatnot. So farm prices are falling, prices for farm crops are falling, and you have this terrible drought. Uh, it devastates communities uh, in many parts of Montana, especially these agrarian-based communities. In fact, it's so bad, I think, Terry, this is one of the most telling uh, statistics yeah. for Montana. Uh, of the 48 states within the Union in, say, 1930, out of 48 states, only one uh, has a population loss between 1920 and 1930. A net loss, and that's Montana. Uh, and it's Montana. 47 mm -hmm. grow. Mm -hmm. Now, the, some grow the, faster than others. At the same time, when the, when the cost of governments, particularly local governments, is increasing because of the internal combustion engine, they have to buy fire engines, they have to buy police cars and so forth, uh, in a declining uh, and, and uh, uh, depression-ridden population. That's between 1920 and 1930. 30. And again, most of that is occurring in rural Montana. Right. It's not occurring in urban yeah. Montana, it's occurring in rural Montana. The population it, of rural Montana peaked in 1920. It's been going down every 10 years since. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, then, and then in the 1930s, of course, starting in 1929, you have the Great Depression. Uh, so Montana really, in fact, we often like to say that Montana's Great Depression isn't one decade long, it's two decades long. Mm -hmm. um, it means that Montana's rural communities uh, have to suffer through these hard times uh, from essentially from say 1919 up to about 1940. Now from 1940 onward things begin to get better. The droughts are finally broken. Uh, World War II brings great demand, demand for various goods including agricultural goods uh, and those, those demands would continue in the post-war years as America works to rebuild the global economy. So you might say, oh, well, things are better now in rural areas. Maybe the population will pick up. But of course, now you've got modern mechanization. And so these small family farms that once existed, uh, those are going by the board. Uh, you now begin to have uh, larger farms, not of a, dozen acre, a few dozen acres or a few hundred acres, but of thousands of acres. So, so mechanization allows fewer and fewer people to grow more and more agricultural products. So and as Harry says, even though the economy in Montana overall writes itself from the 1940s onward, it doesn't affect the rural population in a positive way. These rural areas continue to lose people uh, with yeah, every I single think, decade uh, I think, that Evan, in this, in this period, uh, uh, right up until the 1960s, perhaps, uh, uh, the, the Anaconda Company controlled the Montana legislature. Mm -hmm. It recruited candidates, it funded their campaigns, it ran, a, it, it ran a bill writing service, a bill filing service, a bill tracking uh, service. Uh, it uh, was essentially the uh, professional staff of the legislature, right up until 1957, as we'll see. And if I can tell my one story mm -hmm. about Montana control, Montana, uh, Montana uh, uh, agri uh, anaconda control of the legislature, a friend of mine, John Toole, the brother of of uh, the historian K. Ross Toole and later the mayor of uh, Missoula served one term in the uh, state legislature. He was elected in 1952. And he had a bill to raise the salaries of county employees. And he took it into the local government committee which was staffed, he said, by seven cowboys who didn't come from cities, didn't come from counties where they needed a, a professional staff. He said they all had their booted feet on the table and their hats on. And he presented this bill uh, and he says, before I got out of the room, they tabled it. Mm -hmm. 
But as soon as I got out of the room, the Montana, the Anaconda Company lobbyist came up and said, John, you just tried for a little too much too soon. Here, introduce this bill. And it was the same bill with a smaller increase of salaries, sailed through the legislature. Yeah. I think it, uh, the, the proverbial signal from the company of this or this Up on or bills, down. it seems to have, that's not just anecdotal. I mean, uh, the watering holes. The company ran 24-hour watering holes. You didn't have to, uh, uh, to, to pay uh, for food or drink. If you were if you were so uh, inclined, if you take care of the yeah. legislature, but I think you make a, a good point there, Harry. That that the representatives of the Anaconda Company, they could kill bills that they opposed, or they could get bills they favored passed, in part because they had s the support of these rural legislators, yeah. that th they often viewed political issues yeah. in, in in a common fashion. But with this change in population would those rural areas be able to continue to hold those seats in the state legislature? Uh, and so, me, the, so that become, well, just, yeah. and Harry's written about this in, in his earlier work, that in 1960, that's the first census which indicated that a majority of Montanans were now living in urban areas, not rural areas. So over half of all Montanans were living in cities, and yet the state legislature, both the House and the Senate, but especially the Senate, was, were firmly controlled by these uh, rural legislators that came from the 56. Or and that strength, that rural Congress. strength, with the, which was probably uh, the emblematic thing was probably the Montana Stock Growers Association, which was and the, the Farm Bureau and the Farm Bureau, which were the allies of uh, the Anaconda Company and Montana Power, if you will. That was kind of the power elite, if you will. Now, uh, 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 we we heard an interesting. Uh, uh, story in reading uh, Gene Tidball was the one of the first, I think he may have been the first uh, director of the Legislative Council. He later ended up being an Anaconda Company attorney down in Denver. And a biographer of his ancestor yeah. who was a colonel in the U.S. Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> so Gene was an amazing guy and I did happen to know him. Yeah, I've and, and you know, he, uh, he said when he first went to the Legislative Council he tried to figure out there were four, remember, wouldn't have copying machines back then. There were carbon, carbon copy, carbon paper, and the typewriters. And he said there were four original copies of every bill made, and he knew where three of them went, but he couldn't figure out where the fourth one went. So he assigned one of his staff people, go find out, this is what he says in his oral history, go find out where that fourth copy goes, because I'd like to know where the fourth copy goes. And the guy came back and says it goes to the Anaconda Company. It goes to the sixth floor of the Finland Hotel uh, in Helena. Yeah, where yeah, the yeah. company set up yeah. its bill uh, running a legislative process yeah. organization. So it's fair to say that dominance was very strong and, and breaking out of it uh, took a lot of different things including economic change of the Anaconda Company but also a change of the makeup of the legislature which reapportion, federal reapportionment is, uh, comes to play here. If we're talking about forces that we know the copper collar was there and it was strong but then the newspapers were given up there was an economic decline of the Anaconda Company. Uh, we should talk about that very quickly, and then we'll talk, why don't we talk about that before we go into the reapportionment. The decline of the Anaconda Company economically, uh, with open pit mining and what would happen in, in South America. Right, well in, uh, in 1923, Anaconda bought the Guggenheim Holdings in Chile. Uh, World's largest open pit copper mine, seven, then and big, now. Biggest St uh, capital transaction in the world at that point. On Wall Street at that yeah. time, yes, $77 million. Yeah. And of course, of course mm -hmm. it, it indicated just how powerful this company had become. But from that point onward, more and more of their operations shifted overseas, and that meant that the mining in Montana, while still valuable, wasn't as critical to, to the them. bottom line. And it was valuable to Montana, expensive and Montana, but, but not as valuable to the company. To the company. Yeah. And, and then clearly the richest ores had been depleted by the time we get up to the 1940s and early 50s. And the company concludes that the only way to continue to turn a profit off of its mines in Butte is by beginning open pit mining, which they do in 1955. Prior to that, it was all underground. Right, right. Following, chasing the veins which, underground, then it became open And pit. I think we, looking back on it from today's perspective, we could say to some degree that's the beginning of the end. Uh, it, of course, has...
uh, ultimately a devastating impact on Uptown Butte, mm -hmm. physically speaking. Well, my favorite statistic, Evan, about uh, Anaconda and uh, its workers is that at the height uh, of employment in World War I, it employed 15,000, 15,000, count them, underground hard rock miners, skilled underground muckers. Mm -hmm. How many does it did it employ at the end? Zero. Yeah, in, Zero. Fact, in fact, I was there when we were trying to get the remaining holdings sold, which eventually were purchased by Dennis Washington, and there were 17 people there oiling the hinges to keep the place open until it could be sold from 15,000 underground miners That's to... That's the story of uh, Montana writ large. Yeah, yeah. So we can say that by the mid-50s, uh, mining was beginning to lose its its clout in Butte and in Montana as a whole. It, still ha it was still happening, uh, but the glory days uh, had, had uh, uh, begun to end by that point. And the number of employees was uh, dramatically uh, being reduced. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then another thing that you mentioned, 19, and there were, there were winds of reform that were beginning to blowing. And one example of that then was the creation of the Legislative Council mm -hmm. uh, in 1957. Uh, that would do some very important work. A lot of citizens weren't aware of it, but they would do some tremendously important research in preparing Montana for the changes that were going to be coming over the next couple of decades. They would professionalize uh, that uh, research project, process. So that's 57. 59, uh, the Anaconda Company sells its newspapers in Montana to the lead newspaper chain. Now we might say, that was an out-of-state operation. It was based in the Midwest. Uh, but this wasn't a mining company. Uh, this was a company specializing in professional journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and they not only then worked to, to train or retrain uh, their editors and, and their uh, reporters, sending them off to conferences across the United States, uh, many of them in New York City, Columbia University. Uh, but they also allow those people to cover uh, local stories in a way that could have never happened while the company controlled those newspapers. So now, the, all of that's happening yeah. in the mid and late 1950s. Now, Governor, Governor Schwinden, in one of his uh, uh, one of our programs, uh, says, in his opinion, uh, a number of things led to this period of change. Uh, one of them was the professionalism and the, uh, ev eventually a free, unencumbered press which opened the gates for information flow in Montana, which he said he thought was the single most important thing uh, to the ultimate changes. Uh, but he also mentioned the emergence of a different body politic after World War II with the soldiers coming home, uh, more experienced, uh, broader vision, uh, and then getting under the GI Bill educated. It's true, we, uh, it, uh, it's a different uh, demographic uh, profile after World War II. Uh, uh, and Bob mentioned that the 1960 census revealed that for the first time in its history, Montana was technically an urban uh, state with more than half of the people living in what the Census Bureau defines as cities. It's the weirdest looking urban state uh, in the nation. It doesn't look at all like New Jersey. Uh, in fact, Montana has been described as a medium-sized American city with long streets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that has continued. The, popu the percentage of the population uh, living in urban areas really hasn't changed that much, but the most amazing statistic is this. We have 56 counties, 56 counties. Over half of the people live in just five of them, mm -hmm. and pretty soon it's going to be just four of them. Mm -hmm. So we're becoming more of an urban uh, urban state. But, but so, the problem with that, the fact that by 1960 Montana was an urban state, the problem was the state was still saddled with the 1889 Constitution. And according to that Constitution, each state would have one, uh, excuse me, county, each county, county would have one state senator. So that you had malapportionment in Montana. You had, you had Yellowstone County with almost 80,000 people having one state senator. You had Petroleum County with less than 900 people having one state senator. And this revolution came from the top, Evan. It came from the United States Supreme Court. In the cases of Baker versus Carr, which dealt with malapportionment in Tennessee, and Reynolds versus Sims, which dealt with unequal populations in congressional district. 
reapportionment was forced on Montana by the United States Supreme Court in, in the mid 1960s. And in fact, wasn't the Mo Montana legislature so resistant to it that they wouldn't reapportion themselves in any equitable fan manner that it took they a had federal to do it by court order, district right, court order. District court did it. Right, yeah. federal district court federal did it in, in 1965 court. for the first and another, time. So it would, not only did we uh, end up with, uh, with uh, a reapportionment, but it created equal electoral districts. Mm -hmm. uh, something like uh, 52. Uh, well, they were multi-county originally, yeah. but well, ultimately with the new constitution, they became they, they single broke member the county districts. They broke the county but now essentially you, by reflecting the urban movement, it was a change so that there, this, this economic uh, demographic change in Montana led to the period of progressive change uh, with help from the U.S. Supreme Court and the district court. In well, I, uh, you know, I would argue that the most important event in 19th century America was the coming of the railroads in the 1880s. How about for the 20th century? Well, take your pick. It's either the Great Depression uh, and the uh, intrusion of the federal government in lots of aspects of the American economy and politics, especially Native American uh, rule, uh, or it's World War II. Mm -hmm. World War II, as Governor uh, Schwinden would uh, argue. Uh, and I think what happened after World War II, in many respects, was a diversification of the Montana uh, economy. It's only after World War II that you get big box store chains coming into Montana cities, fast food uh, establishments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which the Anaconda Company and its iron control of local government had, had for the most part, prevented before then. So it became far more difficult to keep an iron hand on, on Montana politics. So the Anaconda Company, economically is declining. I mean, the death knell of that, by the way, was when their, all of their investment in Chile uh, was taken away from them by the Allende government. Allende yeah. comes in and with, sits down and nationalizes and yeah. takes mm -hmm. over. 1971. In 71, so that's during the period of change we're talking about. They were already in decline and suddenly this, what used to be the fourth largest corporation in the world, had been totally decimated mm -hmm by a nationalization of all it their happened properties. 9-11, 9-11, 9-11-71. And boom, all of a sudden it, its economic power is totally gone. Montana power kind of picked the mantle up as much as it could politically, but the, that was kind of the death knell of the economics well, and, and of the And copper Anaconda. became less important to the American economy. You're not transmitting information over copper wires now, you're doing it electronically with fiberglass uh, materials. So, it so the price of copper plummeted. Mm -hmm. The world price of copper, to, copper hit, uh, I think, an all-time low for the 20th century. In fact, copper's pricing now, which is very good, is based upon the growth from third world status economies in the, outside the United States yep. who have created a demand that we had decades back. And so it's, it's a very, but we and did Chile now, produces half the world's copper now. Yeah. I think, but, yeah, but I think we should get back, sort of wrap up the loose ends regarding sure. reapportionment. Yes. Because viewers today might not understand why that was such an important issue. Uh, but the courts ultimately concluded that the malapportionment that existed in Montana was essentially anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. That people did not have equal representa representation in their state government. You know, and, and that's, that's what the civil rights movement yeah. was all about that uh, you couldn't disenfranchise 10% of the American population, the African American population, which occurred across mm -hmm. the South uh, until the Voting Rights Act of 1964, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act yeah, of 1965 were passed. So, is, so it was about equal representation, mm -hmm. which is protected, is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. in the Constitution. This is, this is Phoebe Herwig of Butte. Mm -hmm. who filed suit yeah. in district court and said, I'm not fairly represented in the state legislature. And the court said, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, I talked about uh, the comparison of Yellowstone County and Petroleum County. Here's another way of thinking about that. Uh, before reapportionment, um, I've got to get the figure straight in my mind, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Less than less than half of the U.S. Uh, less than half of the Montana population uh, 
lived in rural areas, and yet those rural counties controlled 84 percent, 84 percent of the seats in the Montana Senate. So that was malapportionment with a vengeance. And, and, and it was not quite as bad in the House because they did factor in some additional representatives, but it was not nearly uh, so, equal. So when, when the state is then reapportioned, uh, starting in 1965, and, and then other changes occurred after that, it means that those urban areas that tended to be less conservative are going to have a much greater say in the state legislature. Which, which led to this progressive period because you had this uh, representation of urban people to a higher degree. I always remember when Dave Manning, who was out of Hysham, a wonderful, served in the Senate for 52 years, said, well, you know, this, you know, uh, you know, cows and cattle, uh, no, no, cattle and coal need to be repre have representation too, instead of just people. But of course the court said it's only the people that counted. Not but, trees or acres yeah, was yeah, the court's phrase. Yeah, Not trees yeah. or acres. Now, now uh, I want to kind of try to wrap this up and see if I if properly summarizing that we we started with a constitution that was essentially conservative but reflecting the economic realities of its time uh, and uh, a consolidation and strengthening of the economic and political power of the Anaconda Company and its allies in the railroads and the, the, uh, the agricultural industry in eastern Montana uh, and uh, uh, a period of progressive change in Montana in the early part of the 20th century which uh, ultimately uh, went away and we had a tightening of the copper collar, the control of the press, uh, strong control of the legislature by uh, uh, in, in all forms, uh, a government that was by basis of the Constitution had a weak executive and a not a strong legislature, uh, but that was controlled by the by the powerful interests were comfortable with that. Uh, that's how the copper collar was tightly around Montana. So it was one of only two states in the nation. Uh, dominated by a single corporation to any degree, us in Delaware. And, and, but from that, seeds of change started to happen. We've reflected in our subsequent programs on what actually happened during the period of change, but leading up to the period of change was changing demographics, the de decline of the economics of the Anaconda Company, changing demographics that uh, ultimately, economic diversification, uh, uh, diversification of the economy, reapportionment, which established a, a, a governmental structure that reflected people and led to a more progressive uh, uh, reflection in the in the governmental structures. Those were the things that happened uh, leading up to the period of change that we're talking about, and the loss of control of the press by the Anaconda Company, them giving it up. Uh, and their Television was a competing source of uh, news. That the an emerging uh, informed electorate and engaged electorate out of World War II, which was more enlightened and then more educated. So out of those things, we entered the crucible of change. Is that a kind of a fair reflection? I, would, I would say, Evan, that in 1965, the state of Montana was on the verge of its most fundamental decade of change mm -hmm. since the 1880s. Not and just politically, but economically and ideologically with the coming of the environmental movement. The court-ordered reapportionment went into effect for the 1966 election, so the 1967 legislature might be regarded as the first modern legislature mm -hmm. in 20th century modern. And, and out of this, we enter the crucible of change, period. And that, in subsequent programs, that we're going to have, we're going to have about 30 some programs, going to reflect that change. We appreciate each of you providing the context for that change. Thank you very much and we look forward to seeing you on subsequent programs of In the Crucible of Change. <laughs>